Welcome everyone to this uh, webinar, which is part of the Institute of Health and Wellbeing's Morris Block Lecture Series. Um, in terms of just some quick housekeeping before I introduce our speaker, um, the plan is that the uh, speaker is going to speak for 45 minutes and we're going to have between 10 and 15 minutes at the end for questions. You can post questions at the end by filling in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Hopefully people can work out how to do that. Uh, please make sure that your webcam is off and that you are muted if you're an attendee. Um, and as I said, when the lecture's finished, please send your questions in and we'll try to answer as many as we can. So without further delay, it's my great pleasure to introduce Linda Geddes. Uh, Linda is an award-winning British science journalist and author. Uh, she spent nine years working at New Scientist magazine um, as a news editor, as features editor and a reporter, and still remains a consultant to New Scientist today. Linda has received numerous awards for her journalism, including the Association of British Science Writers Award for Best Investigative Journalism. And her most recent book that we're going to hear a little bit of this afternoon is called Chasing the Sun, The New Science of Sunlight and How It Shapes Our Bodies and Minds. And it looks like that. Um, and this book explores the significance of sunlight from ancient solstice celebrations to modern sleep labs and the impact this has on public health uh, in light polluted cities as well as the importance of, uh, of ex excessive exposure to bright lights from devices. So this talk will focus on how public health can address this issue to improve population health and wellbeing. So without further delay, um, thanks Linda for agreeing to be our speaker today and over to you. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry I can't actually be in Glasgow to do this lecture, but we will we'll do our best. Um, so Florence Nightingale, wrote that it's the unqualified result of all my experience with the sick that second only to their need of fresh air is their need of light and what hurts that after a close room what hurts most is a dark room and it's not only light but sunlight that they want. Florence Nightingale is often referred to as the founder of modern nursing. She rose to prominence during the Crimean War um, where she was a manager and trainer of nurses and organised care for wounded soldiers. And Florence Nightingale didn't know what sunlight does to us in any kind of molecular sense. People didn't know back in the, in the 19th century. Um, but she simply observed that her soldiers, her patients did better if, um, if they saw the sun compared to if they spent their days shut away indoors. And she also observed how they'd often lie in their beds facing, turning and facing towards the window, almost growing towards the light, just like plants do. Um, and even she even even when they even when doing so was painful for them. Um, and she believed that the morning sun and the kind of lunchtime sun was the most important. And she recommended that um, nurses try to get patients out of their beds to at least go and sit by a window or get outdoors if at all possible. Sorry, I'm, I'm double screening here. <laughs> I think it's a lesson that we do well to remember today, particularly with so many of us shut away on coronavirus lockdown right now. But even in more normal times, you know, consider our hospitals, our care homes, even our schools, our offices and factory floors. If you're lucky, you'll have a window, but often these windows aren't accessible to people. If you're in a, a large hospital ward and your bed is a long way from the window, the light levels in your hospital room might be very dim. And then you have this second problem of the lights being switched on um, often overnight. You know, they're usually dimmed, but often they're not completely dim. And so this is, you know, this is, this is very different to the conditions we evolved under. So today's lecture is all about the impact of light and particularly sunlight on our health and well-being. And I've started with Florence Nightingale really because even though she didn't understand what was going on with sunlight, I think she had a, a good point after all. So for most of human history, we spent our daytimes outdoors in sunlight and our evenings were dim and pretty uneventful places. The only source of light after dusk came from burning things like wood, oil, wax, and these things were unaffordable for most households. So people would rise with the sun and they would tend to retire to bed early. And then 140 years ago, this happened. 
Electric lighting has transformed the way we live our lives. It allows us to work and socialise around the clock. Without it, even working indoors would be difficult. So any prolonged indoor work would give us eye strain unless you got to sit in a big window like I'm sitting in right now. Um, and our evenings would be pretty dim. So I think, you know, electric lighting has a lot going for it, but it also has a dark side. About 12 or 13 years ago, I found myself here in Las Vegas, the gambling capital of the world. Um, so at night, the Las Vegas Strip is reportedly the brightest place on earth and people flood outside to take in this incredible neon light show. But, but the funny thing is that during the daytime, no one goes outside. The streets are deathly quiet because you've got these, you know, these chains of underground shopping malls linking one resort to the next. Um, and these vast casino floors just, you know, where they just use artificial light. So, so really Las Vegas has flipped our traditional relationship with day and night on its head. And I was in this topsy-turvy city covering a conference for New Scientist um, where I used to work. Um, I'd spent several days shut away in these dark windowless meeting rooms and then my evenings being dragged around these casinos by, <laughs> by a bunch of forensic scientists. And um, by the end of this, I was feeling really muddled and mixed up and I had terrible jet lag as well. And I was just really desperate to get outside and bask in a little bit of sunlight. I'd been editing a lot of stories around that time about these things called circadian rhythms, which we'll get to in a little while. And, and the importance of light in synchronizing these rhythms, but also, um, but also shift work, so night shift work, had just been um, designated a probable human carcinogen by the International Agency for Research on Cancer. So I was very kind of aware of the, the possibly the bad effects of being exposed to, to light at night. Um, anyway, eventually I found myself in this um, underground maze, which is the Caesars Palace Mall, glimpsing what looked like sunlight up ahead. So I got very excited. Um, but when I got there and looked up, what I saw was this, a beautiful but completely fake sky. <laughs> and it really kind of, it was a kind of like a moment where I just kind of went, what's going on, what's going on, you know? <laughs> um, it really made me start to question our relationship with light in the modern world and whether this artificial light and this kind of distorted relationship with natural light is such a good thing after all. I realise Las Vegas is extreme, but for most of us we have a very different relationship with light and particularly sunlight to even that of our great great grandparents and I think it's beginning to take its toll on our, our health, our sleep and possibly our relationships. Um, because the thing is, our biology is set up to work in partnership with sunlight and with this 24 hour cycle of light and dark on this planet. Stepping back in time to the 19th century again, Florence Nightingale lived during a time of enormous change. The Industrial Revolution um, saw humans transition from a predominantly agricultural way of life to an indoor and urban one. People flocked to these smog filled cities to work in mills and factories. And they often lived in extremely gloomy and cramped conditions. And as a result of this, this new disease started to spring up. Rickets. So a survey by the British Medical Association in the 1880s flagged up the uniquely urban nature of this problem. <coughs> Rickets just wasn't seen in the countryside in small villages. Um, various theories were put forward to explain this, including air pollution, bread contaminated with aluminium. But then an English miss missionary called Thomas Palm, who'd spent a lot of time traveling in Asia and Africa, um, suggested that it was a deficiency of sunlight. He called it a disease of leaden skies. And he proposed that sun baths, so basically sunbathing, might be a cure. And um, sure enough, it worked. So here we can, in this picture, we can see this is um, heliotherapy as sun, sun therapy. So here's a child with rickets and then after two years of regular sun exposure their bone the bones start to to repair themselves so you know in the 1880s people didn't know why what what the mystery thing in sunlight was that 
that strengthened bones. But, but in the 1920s, they discovered what it was, it's vitamin D. So vitamin D regulates the amount of calcium and phosphorus in our bones and teeth, making them strong and healthy. But this is, this is by far, the, uh, this is not the only thing that sunlight can do, or even vitamin D. So one other thing it does is um, sunlight kills bacteria. In the 1870s, two British scientists made this discovery because they took these test tubes of sugar water, sugary water, and they put them in a sunny windowsill and they covered one of them up with lead to prevent any sunlight getting to it and left the other test tube on the windowsill for about a month. Then they came back and looked at them and they removed the lead sheet and they saw that this test tube that had been covered up was cloudy and it smelled disgusting. Whereas the tube that had remained exposed to sunlight was clear and, and as it was at the beginning. And they went on to discover that the reason was that sunlight kills bacteria. The first practical application of this um, interesting discovery um, was, the, was um, the use of sunlight and then later electric UV light um, to kill the bacterium that causes tuberculosis of the skin. So this man here, Niels Finsen, um, was a Danish scientist who discovered this. And he built these bizarre looking contraptions. Um, this, this is filtering UV lights down these, these long water filled tubes, um, which had various glass lenses in to concentrate the light, the UV light. Um, and then the water in the tubes cooled it down so it didn't burn the skin. And he turned it against this disease, lupus vulgaris or skin tuberculosis, which at the time was, you know, the disease that no one wanted to catch. Um, it, the name lupus, vulgar, lupus comes from wolf because it produced these horrible wolfish ulcers, ulcers which literally kind of consumed the skin. So when he, you know, made this discovery of, of basically a cure, um, it was a really big deal and he was awarded the Nobel Prize, I think it was in um, 1902. Uh, but this was just the beginning <coughs> because Vincent's, um, Vincent's work in this area kind of popularised this idea of sun cures and by the 1920s sunlight was being touted as a cure for pretty much every disease under the sun um, but especially tuberculosis of the bones of the joints and um, and of the lungs which is what most of us think of when we think of, of TB. Why would that be? I mean it's not that UV light is going you know you can see how it would um, kill bacteria in the skin but what's it doing in the lungs? what's it doing in our bones where there's no access of the UV light to these tissues? Well, it turns out that vitamin D isn't only needed to build healthy bones and teeth. Um, it, there are also vitamin D receptors on our immune cells um, and vitamin D enables them to produce this antimicrobial peptide called cathelicidin, which helps them kill pathogens like bacteria. It also seems effective against um, some viruses. Certainly um, there's respiratory synctal virus and influenza. Um, and some of you may have noticed some newspaper stories in recent days about whether vitamin D supplements might be a good idea in the current situation we're facing with coronavirus. I think we don't know that at the moment, but I think it's definitely worthy of, of exploration. Especially, you know, uh, in the UK at the moment, we're just coming out of winter and so all of us have pretty low vitamin D levels at this time. So, you know, obviously too much sun sunlight is bad for us. UV light triggers mutations in our DNA, which left unchecked can lead to cancer. Um, <coughs> So I certainly wouldn't advocate prolonged sunbathing, especially if you have a pale Scottish comple complexion like me. Um, and another reason why sun exposure can lead to cancer is because it suppresses the immune system. So actually our immune cells are pretty good at spotting um, unusual cells and destroying them. But if their activity is being suppressed by too much UV light, then they become less effective.
So you've got this double whammy from UV light. But at the same time, it's possible that a bit of sun exposure is good for our immune systems. There's a, there's a growing, um, growing belief among immunologists that it might actually just kind of help tweak the immune system and keep those kind of um, rampant immune responses in check. So it's currently actually being explored as a possible so vitamin D, but also UV light is currently being explored as a potential treatment for multiple sclerosis, which is an autoimmune disease where our immune cells attack our own body tissues. So to summarise, sunlight does lots of things for our body. Um, you know, it, it strengthens our bones and teeth. It tweaks our immune systems in various ways. It can kill germs directly. There are other things it can do which I haven't mentioned, including um, tweaking our blood pressure, which is very strange and interesting. Um, but the big thing that I'm going to spend the rest of this time talking about is circadian rhythms. So inside every cell of our bodies, there's a molecular clock which controls the timing of pretty much every biological process from when we feel sleepy and alert to when we release various hormones, to the activity of our immune cells, which varies over 24 hours. So even our brain chemistry, so the neurotransmitters that we're releasing in our brains. They're called circadian rhythms and our bodies really are a different place during the day compared to at night. Now in some people, these rhythms tick along at slightly under 24 hours. In other people, they're closer to 25 hours. And yet all of us manage to stay synchronized with the time of day outside. You know, most of us tend to feel sleepy at about the same time each night. And we tend to wake up more or less at the time, same time each morning. How can that be? Well, the answer is light. So when light hits a subset of cells at the back of the eye, just behind the rods and cones that allow us to see, it's like pushing the reset but button on a stopwatch. Those eye cells, they're called, it's got a very long name, intrinsically photoreceptive retinal ganglion cells. Those eye cells <laughs> speak to a tiny little patch of brain tissue called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which acts as the body's master clock. And then it sends messages to all those other little clocks around the body and every organ and tissue, keeping them synchronized to the time of day outside as well. But actually, when you see that light is important, because it can affect the timing of our clocks in another way. Most people will identify as either larks or night owls. People who like to wake up early or who just can't really stand the mornings and like to stay, like to stay up late. These things are largely determined by our genetics, but light can influence them as well. So if you see light early in the morning, it makes you more larkish. Whereas if you see it in the evening or especially at night, it pushes your clocks later, making you more of a night owl. And that's fine if you can choose when you get up to go to work or school the next morning. But if you can't, and you stay up late because you don't feel tired until later, it can mean that you cut short your sleep. Excuse me. Light, um, light does other things as well. So those same eye cells at the back of your eye also speak to brain areas that control mood and alertness. And they're particularly sensitive to light in the blue part of the spectrum. You might have heard a lot about blue light being particularly bad and we should avoid blue light at night. And that's because those eye cells that control our circadian rhythms, but also feed into these mood and alertness areas are particularly responsive to blue spectrum light. And that, it doesn't necessarily look blue. So, so daylight includes a lot of blue light. In fact, daylight contains light from across the spectrum. Um, but there are things like, you know, um, various light bulbs, particularly modern LED light bulbs have a very big spike in blue light. So, um, you know, that's, that's a good thing if we're exposed to bright or blue spectrum light during the daytime because it makes us more alert and more ready to respond to our environment. But if you see it at night, then it's another thing that can make it harder to fall asleep. And sleep really does matter. 
not getting enough of it makes, makes us less coordinated, less vigilant, less able to solve problems. It makes it harder to regulate our emotions and, um, and read the emotions of other people. <coughs> it affects our memories and it affects our health. Sleeping for fewer than six hours a night has been shown to make you four times more susceptible to catching a cold. And then longer term, chronic sleep deprivation has been associated with, associated with pretty much every non-infectious disease going, including Alzheimer's, cancer, type 2 diabetes, heart disease. It also affects our relationships. People who routinely get fewer than six hours of sleep per night have been shown to display more unethical or deviant, beha deviant behaviour in the workplace. That could be being mean to um, your co-workers or employees or taking credit, credit for other people's work or falsifying receipts. Um, so, you know, that unpleasant manager, you know, might be a nicer person if they only took sleep a little bit more seriously. So how can we forge a healthier relationship with light? Well, when I was researching my book, Chasing the Sun, I decided to find out what would happen if I reverted to this more traditional relationship with light. Um, so I teamed up with some researchers from the University of Surrey, and we devised this experiment to measure what would happen if I tried to spend much more of my daytime outdoors in sunlight and um, try and turn off the lights in the evening. We did this in December and January, so um, and I needed to carry on working because if I didn't work, I wouldn't have any money. Um, but we, but we, so we decided, okay, I'm going to turn the lights off after six p.m. and after that time, just to use candles. Um, and I, I did this. Uh, I wore this, I and mean, you can just about see on this picture actually. I wore this this watch on my wrist. Um, called an Acti watch, which measured my light exposure, but also it's a bit like a Fitbit, so it can it can kind of track your sleep and work out when how much sleep you're getting and that kind of thing. Um, and I filled in lots of these mood and alertness questionnaires. <coughs> Persuading my family to live like this took a little bit of persuasion. My daughter burst into tears and told me that it would be spooky, <laughs> but I eventually got her on board and. Um, and you know we we actually we actually found it a really positive thing by the end of this we did it for about six weeks on and off kind of testing different protocols you know so some weeks we had um we had we just worried about the evening light exposure there were other weeks where i didn't worry about the evening light at all but just made more of an effort to get outdoors and some weeks where we combined the two of them and, you know, it created some challenges. So um, cooking in the dark was a bit hazardous, particularly chopping onions, um, but it also had lots of benefits. So my husband said that conversations felt more intimate when they were conducted by candlelight. We had a New Year's Eve party where a load of friends came over to hang out with us in the dark. <laughs> and they also commented on the relaxed atmosphere and, and how nice it felt actually to be sitting around by candlelight. Also, we had to, we didn't measure this, but we, um, we had a load of children in our house that night as well, and we had to put them to sleep outdoors. And they were all asleep by like nine o'clock, which is, you know, if anyone has um, young children, you'll know that that is basically unheard of. Um, spending more of my daytime outdoors was really another revelation for me. I, as I said, I'm a journalist, I work, so, and I need a desk and a computer screen, and it was December, so I couldn't, you know, I couldn't switch to working outdoors all the time like an agricultural worker. I needed to be indoors, but I did what I could. So um, I, one of the main things I did was I switched my indoor exercise for the outdoor equivalent. So this is my local park. These are my kettlebells and I'd go out there at seven in the morning or seven. Well, what time did it get light in, in December, 7.30 or eight o'clock. Um, and actually I really, really enjoyed seeing the sunrise I still do I still do it I meet a friend on Fridays or I did until the lockdown and we we um, we work out at seven in the morning and see the sunrise and it's it's a really lovely way to start the day and it really did change me so once a week we measured when I started to release this hormone called melatonin which um, 
which is released under the control of the circadian clock. And so measuring what time you start to release this hormone can give you a really good indication of what time your internal clock thinks it is. And what we found was that on the weeks where I turned off the lights at six o'clock, or I combined this with getting more daylight, daylight the timing of those internal sh clocks shifted one and a half to two hours earlier. So I was becoming more larkish. This has also been seen, um, there's some American researchers who've sent groups of, um, groups of people camping to look at what happens to their circadian timing and they found a similar thing. If you spend your daytimes outdoors in bright sunlight and you reduce the amount of light you see in the evening, you become more larkish. Um, but I think that's really important because it suggests that, you know, you don't necessarily need to completely give up on artificial light at night, not watch television, not use your smartphone, if you can spend more of your daytime outdoors. Obviously, this was a study of just me, um, but it has been seen in larger and more carefully controlled studies as well. So one of them found that on average, office workers who are exposed to more daylight, especially in the morning, um, took 18 minutes to fall asleep at night on average compared to 45 minutes for those who spent their mornings in dim light. They also slept for about an extra 20 minutes longer each night on average and had less disturbed sleep. And there's even actually some evidence that being exposed to bright or blue enriched light in the morning can buffer your body clock against those effects of artificial light at night. So it stops that shift towards later sleep timing that, that most of us are probably actually experiencing. We're probably all a little bit more larkish than we think. And that's the other thing. So they also looked at depression scores. So they weren't, these people weren't clinically depressed, but every day they had to fill in a mood questionnaire just like I did. And they saw that they scored lower on this self-rated scale of depression. Excuse me. So I think we might have some teenagers listening to this today. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about, about them because I think teenagers are actually a population who could really benefit from this approach. It's not just, you know, middle-aged sleep deprived mothers like me. Um, children naturally become more owlish as they approach adolescence. Um, it's just something that happens. We don't really understand why. But, you know, asking a teenager to get up for school at seven in the morning is like asking me to get up at 5 a.m it's that extreme, the shift towards more owlishness. Um, so no wonder they don't want to do it. Um, but what it often means is that because they don't feel tired until later, um, they can't fall asleep till later. And then we're still asking them to get up for school the next day. And that means that they're kind of chronically sleep deprived. So one solution might be for secondary schools to shift their start times later. Um, this has happened a lot. This has been happening a lot in the US in recent years. And it has, you know, it's, it's pretty much widely accepted now that teenagers should not be starting school at 7.30, which is what they used to do in the US. Um, but, you know, and, and kids now, kids report, you know, feeling better, feeling less tired, actually getting more sleep because they've realized how much better they feel just getting that little bit of extra sleep by starting school later. And then apparently um, some of them are even starting to go to bed earlier voluntarily because they've just realized how much better they feel when they're getting a proper night's sleep. What about in the UK? I mean, our schools, you know, start at sort of 8.30, 9 o'clock-ish. Um, could we benefit as well? Well, there was a study of this English school where they shifted the school start time from 8.50 a.m. to 10 a.m. And what they found was that the rates of absence dropped from 15.4 days on average per year before this change was made to just 7.3 days absence on average per year. Um, two years after they'd introduced this change. 
they also saw this improvement in GCSE scores. So 34% um, of pupils were obtaining a good GCSE grade, like A to C, before the change, and then that rose to 52% afterwards. As I said earlier, you know, sleep really does matter, and it's not just about school grades. There was another study that found that teenagers whose parents managed to persuade them to go to bed earlier, um, those teenagers are at lower risk of depression and suicidal thinking. So, you know, I really do think schools, school start times, making school start times later is a good idea. But until that happens, if it ever does, there is something that teenagers can do to improve their chances of getting more sleep, and that is rethinking their light exposure. Just think about it. If you can, um, if you can shift your sleep timing one and a half to two hours earlier, you're going to want to go to bed earlier and therefore allow yourself more sleep. And I think dim is the really key word here because you don't have to switch to candles. I mean, that's actually, <laughs> it's actually deeply impractical. Um, but you know, dimmer switches, table lamps, you can, get, you can get these smart light bulbs now where you can tune out the blue lights and, and dim, dim the lights. Uh, I think I've got a box, I've got some, we've been fitting them in my house, these, these hue um, bulbs. Um, and also the same should apply to computer screens and smart, sm smartphone screens. So, you know, you can put your iPhone on night shift mode, your laptop, you can, install this software called Flux, which tunes out the blue light and dims your screen. It's really important to also make sure that you dim the screen because a lot of night shift mode things will just remove some of the blue, but there'll still be blue light there. But our eyes are also sensitive to light from any spectrum if it's bright enough. And it, it's increasingly looking as though younger people are more sensitive to lower amounts of light. So so, you know, keep things dim and warm like firelight. But also darkening your evenings and brightening, brightening your days will increase the amplitude of those circadian rhythms. So making them more pronounced, a bigger difference between day and night. And that's important because flattened circadian rhythms seem to be associated with disrupted sleep and also poorer health. But what if you can't make these kind of changes. Maybe you can't spend more of your daytime outdoors and there's nothing you can do about your interior lighting because you're elderly and in a care home or you're seriously, you're seriously ill and in hospital. Hospital patients tend to have just those flattened and disrupted circadian rhythms that I just talked about. And some of that is because their light exposure is so unusual. So hospitals often have small windows. You may not be near the window, um, but also lights are often switched on 24 seven. Certain drugs also seem to interfere with circadian rhythms, including morphine, um, which obviously a lot of hospital patients will be on. And there's some pretty compelling evidence from animal studies, at least, that this, this circadian disruption matters to recovery from injury and illness. So pity the little mice. Um, there's a researcher in Canada called Tammy Martino who has been um, simulating heart attacks, I think in mice, um, basically simulating a heart attack in mice that are either, um, either have regular circadian rhythms because they're kept in conditions where they have 12 hours of light and then 12 hours of darkness, uh, like how mice would live in natural, uh, natural settings. Um, but then they simulate these heart attacks in another group of mice who have the rodent equivalent of jet lag, really. Their, their circadian rhythms are all over the place because their light exposure is so erratic. Now, if you do these experiments, if you give these mice these heart attacks, what you see is the ones with disrupted circadian rhythms are less likely to survive. Um, and you can actually see this difference in the amount of scar tissue that's laid down in their hearts as the hearts are recovering. You see a different, different numbers of immune cells infiltrating into that heart tissue and helping it to recover. 
does the same apply in humans? Should we be trying to improve human circadian rhythms to help them recover from illness and injury? I don't think we know that for sure, but um, certainly there's, there's a few small studies that have suggested that um, patients who've had, say, coronary bypass operations, they recover faster, they're sent home sooner if they are, um, I want to say house, I'm not sure housed is the right word, but if their hospitals, if their hospital rooms have access to a big window rather than them being in a dark hospital ward. So I think we could, you know, there's potential for rethinking the way we light our hospitals. And actually this hospital, Riggs Hospitalet, this, this hospital group in Copenhagen in Denmark have been doing just that. So I went to visit Glostrup Hospital where they have this stroke rehabilitation ward and they've been doing this study looking at introducing circadian lighting um, to see how that um, affects these stroke patients recovery. Now circadian lighting is also kind of some lighting companies refer to it as human centric lighting. What it basically means is this, this photo on the right is what the lighting looks like in the daytime. You have very um, bright kind of bluish white LED lighting fixtures um, and they're trying to simulate daylight. So it's kind of brighter than you'd usually get in a hospital ward. This photo was I think taken in, in, um, in January. So, you know, up in, up in Nordic countries, they have an even greater problem getting daylight into hospital rooms, especially in the winter. Um, so in the daytime, you have this very bright um, blue, blue rich lighting. And then during the evenings, it gets dimmed down to this kind of amber, warm amber light. So they tune out the blue and they make it dimmer and dimmer. And then overnight, most patients are housed in darkness. But if a nurse or doctor has to come in to um, take readings, uh, do any monitoring or if there's an emergency, the emergency lights are also this amber colour. So you have less disruption to their circadian rhythms and sleep. And, you know, this is again, this is still a pilot study. But what they found is that the stroke patients who are housed in these in these rooms with circadian lighting, they have more robust, more robust circadian rhythms, which you'd expect because they have this big difference between the light exposure in the day and at night. Stroke patient, people in, in the immediate aftermath of a stroke are at high risk of depression and fatigue, but these patients kept in the circadian lighting rooms seem to fare better. Um, and in fact, the, they're often given, given antidepressants and um, the effect of just of changing their lighting and strengthening their circadian rhythms is comparable to giving them antidepressants. And then, you know, a subset of these stroke patients also have dementia. And a nurse who cares for these patients in the ward who I interviewed told me that, you know, with these dementia patients, they just seem to have a better idea about what time of day it is. And they seem calmer. And, you know, I think that's, that's interesting as well. So, um, Dementia patients. So, so circadian lighting is also being piloted in care homes, um, looking after people with dementia. Um, and, you know, as we age and get older and older, the, the lens in our eye becomes more cloudy. So it makes it harder for light to get into those light sensitive cells at the back of the eye. And you tend to see this flattening of circadian rhythms. And that's interesting because um, you also see this in dementia patients, but you, with dementia patients, you often see these things, you see this thing, you get this phenomenon called sundowning, where people um, become more irritable and agitated as um, the afternoon and evening progress. You also see a lot of sleep disruption and night waking, so people waking up multiple times in the night, wandering around, that puts them at increased risk of falls. It's actually a reason why people often get put into care homes in the first place because they're wandering around at night and they're not safe anymore. And interestingly, you know, so, so sundowning, night waking, 
Both of these things are associated with flattened and disrupted circadian rhythms. They're also worse during the winter and on cloudy days where you get less of this kind of this, um, this synchronizing effect of sunlight. So anyway, there have been a few trials now looking at whether boosting um, the light exposure of care home residents has any impact on their dementia, uh, dementia symptoms. It can't cure dementia for sure, but, um, but it does seem to result in a slower rate of cognitive deterioration fewer symptoms of depression and less deterioration in everyday tasks. So people are more able to get on with everyday stuff like getting dressed, maybe preparing um, some food for themselves. Um, and if you combine this bright exposure to, to daytime light with um, melatonin supplements, and again, if you remember from my own experiment, taking melatonin as this hormone that you release at night, it helps um, prepare the body for sleep and for what happens in the night time and it's another kind of signal of from the circadian clock of, of you know what what time it is that it's night time um, so if you combine the bright light in the daytime with melatonin supplements again kind of reinforcing this message that it's night time you see improved sleep in these patients There's a growing interest in the link between disrupted circadian rhythms and mood disorders like depression and bipolar disorder as well. And I think Danny may talk about this afterwards um, because I know he's very interested in this. So when I was researching my book, I visited this hospital in Milan where they've pioneered the use of this thing they call triple chronotherapy. And what this is, is um, they're combining light therapy, so exposing, exposing these patients with really severe bipolar depression. They're exposing them to bright light first thing in the morning, just like the way you treat patients with seasonal affective disorder. Um, so they get exposed to bright light first thing in the morning to advance their circadian rhythms, make them more lark-like, and also increase the amplitude of those circadian rhythms. <laughs> they're also depriving them of sleep which may sound completely mad for patients with depression and they're treating them with um with lithium and what these three things seem to do is they seem to jump start these sluggish flattened circadian rhythms that you seem to see in these patients so both patients with bipolar depression and general depression seem to have again these like flat circadian rhythms, this, this circadian disruption. We're not sure why, but, um, but giving them this light therapy, depriving them, them of sleep, giving them lithium, all these things seem to restart these circadian rhythms and they start to feel better. I think the lithium thing is really interesting. So lithium has been given to patients with bipolar disorder for a long time and no one's really understood how it works. Um, but it, it's, it looks as though actually lithium is affecting the working of the circadian clock those you know those molecular clock clocks in our cells so it seems to be um, boosting the expression of this protein called PER2 which is a kind of fundamental um, cog in the wheel of the circadian clock in these cells which I think is fascinating and there's also some evidence actually that SSRI antidepressants are impacting the workings of circadian clocks in our brain cells as well. So studies of chronotherapy for mood disorders are ongoing. I think there's one happening in London at the moment. And I think interest in circadian rhythms is only likely to grow in the coming years, especially with the Nobel Prize having recently been awarded to the scientists who actually unpicked the working of these circadian clocks in our cells. To summarise them, and I'm just seeing what type yet, I'm just about on time. To summarise then, you know, today we light up our evenings in a way our ancestors never did. And we also spend approximately 90% of our lives, more in the current climate, um, but we spend approximately 90% of our lives indoors where it may be bright enough to see, but even on an overcast winter's day, it's often 
25 times brighter outdoors than it is inside. And in the middle of summer, it may be 500 times brighter outside. Just before I started talking, I was fiddling around with this light meter that I have from when I was doing my experiments. And you know, if I take a light, if I take a, if I was to take a light meter reading back here in my office, and I've done this lots of times, so I can tell you, um, it would it would give me a reading of maybe about somewhere around like on a dark, gloomy day, it might be 50, 50 to 100 lux. So light is measured, illuminance or brightness is measured in this unit called lux. So on a kind of dim, gloomy day in the back recesses of my office, um, it would be kind of 50 to 100 lux. On a kind of bright, sunny day, if I was not sitting right in the window as I am here, it might be 200 lux. And that's what you see in lots of offices. If I take my light meter right to the window, <laughs> it's more like a thousand lux. But if I go outside on, you know, a cloudy day, it might be 4,000 lux outside. But on a bright, cloudless day in the middle of summer, it's about 100,000, 100,000 lux outside. It's a lot brighter outside than it is indoors. And I think we really do need to get out there and embrace that light. And so for many of us, that means learning to embrace the outdoors, whatever the weather and whatever the season. At the moment, our outdoor time is limited to reduce transmission of coronavirus. But, um, you know, I do think that trying to get outdoors even now is really, really, really important. And if you can't get outdoors, at least try and spend as much time as possible sitting closer to the windows. As Florence Nightingale said, we humans seem to grow towards the light and it's not only light but sunlight that we want. We evolved on this rotating planet with a 24 hour cycle of light and dark and we really do need to try and reconnect with those extremes. Thank you. I'm gonna take a drink of water now. <laughs> Thanks very much, Linda. That was fantastic. Really clear um, talk. Really interesting. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. I've got one or two, but I think, can I invite people to fill in the Q&A box and then we can try to get through as many questions as possible? Sure. So I'll give people a couple of minutes for that. Um, while we're waiting for the questions to come in, Linda, can I, because I know we've got some schools here involved today as well as some pupils and teachers. And, and I'm thinking about Scotland particularly and schools in Scotland in winter time, for example. Yeah. Whether or not we should be doing more radical things like, you know, should we have PE every day, every morning for every, you know, class? Or, you know, should we be, how should we be bringing classrooms outside, et cetera, et cetera. Any thoughts on that kind of thing? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, I think especially for children, um, we should be trying to get them outdoors as much as possible. Um, and, te and teenagers as well. So, so I haven't mentioned this, but there's quite strong evidence now that actually being exposed to plenty of bright light is really important for eye development as well. So in Asian countries, you're seeing this epidemic of myopia or short sightedness. Um, and it's, it's the most likely culprit seems to be that children are not get getting outdoors enough. Like if you look at studies in in animals, you can see that if um, if the infants are not if the infants are kept in dim light, like indoor light, and they don't get outside, um, their eyeballs elongate, and that's what causes myopia. So um, you know there are these studies ongoing now, which are trying to get Asian kids outdoors in their break times because they're not encouraged to go outdoors at all. A lot of them are kind of hot house; they take academ academic education very very seriously. Um, but, you know, to try and reduce these rates of short sightedness, this is what's, what's being explored. In Sweden, I visited a school in Malmo in Sweden where, you know, they're actually that's on a very similar latitude. I think I think Malmo's on the same latitude as Edinburgh. And um, so, you know, I went there in January. The sun doesn't rise till about 8.30 a.m. And a lot of people suffer from winter depression. Even if they don't have winter depression, they feel really tired and sluggish in the mornings. So the school wanted to see, well, what can we do about this? So they have installed, similar to the, the um, hospital I mentioned in Copenhagen, they've installed this circadian lighting in some of the classrooms. 
Um, so it's very kind of bright and white and um, and there have been a few, so, so th this was part of a study. What this showed actually was that even though, um, even though the kids went home to their, you know, their houses and they didn't worry about their light exposure at home, they, um, they experienced better sleep as a result of having that bright stimulus in their classroom during the daytime. And again, the light kind of dims towards more kind of orangey amber light as the afternoon progresses. So it's, it's basically trying to mimic what you'd be exposed to um, kind of maybe around this time of year where, where um, you know, on the equinoxes where daytime is similar to nighttime. And, you know, most people think that we evolved closer to the equator. And so we're not necessarily, probably we've adapted a bit. And there is a little bit of evidence from populations in Iceland um, that, um, that actually rates of season, seasonal affective disorder are lower there than you'd expect them to be given the latitude. So there may have been some adaption, but, but probably having more equal day and night, you know, light and dark is what suits us best. Great. Thanks, Linda. So we'll try and go through some of these questions. I'll field them for you. Firstly, uh, Audrey's just written that we will be sending a link for this recording in case you've missed bits of it. Hopefully that reassures people. Narissa has asked about blue light blocking glasses. Yeah. And how useful they may or may not be. Um, what do you think? I've been sent some actually. I've got them here. <laughs> so I think they're, so for anyone who has not seen blue blockers, they look like this. So they're actually red. Um, but they block out the blue lights. I mean, I think it's, I think it's a, an interesting idea. I think if you really can't dim your lights in your house, then fine. Um, but I think there's a lot you can do without having to, you know, resort to blue blockers because you, you really can, you know, you can get warm coloured light bulbs now, you can dim mm. the lights. You can install, like I said, this software on computers called Eflux, which is really, really good. Um, anything you can do to tune out that blue light at night is going to be helpful. It does seem as though some individuals are more sensitive to light than others. And there's no way of testing that at the moment, but you probably know who you are anyway, you know. So if you you know, if you, but then I guess if you, if you have to work in a hospital at night or maybe not a hospital, because I'm not sure you could get away with, <laughs> with wearing these in a hospital, or you have to be on public transport at night. Sometimes I commute back from London at sort of 10 o'clock at night or 11 o'clock at night and I find I can't sleep. Um, whereas if I do something like put the blue blockers on or wear dark sunglasses, um, mm. I sleep much better after that. I think also if you're, if you're having to, you know, there's a whole section in my book on jet lag and mitigating jet lag. And actually these things can be really great um, if you're taking a flight and you're going to be exposed on your, on, your, on your flight to bright light at the wrong time of day or night. And actually your light exposure when you're traveling can be really, really important to being able to adjust to the new time zone more quickly. So I think there are situations where where these things yeah. are a really good idea. Sorry, I'm taking a long time. I need That's to... fine. So we've got we've got quite a lot of questions. So maybe we'll try for uh, concise answers if that's okay. <laughs> so uh, next is from Caroline, who's asked, "Have you done any work?" So you haven't really mentioned shift working and health, but I guess there's an easy answer to that. Have I done any work? I haven't. I personally haven't done any work. Sorry. So. <laughs> In so I, think, I, think shift, I think shift work, it's a massive area of research at the moment. One thing I haven't mentioned is that there's another thing that can affect the timing of our clocks and that's meal times. So, um, so when we see, if we see light at night, that shifts the timing of our, of our clocks. Another thing I didn't say is that our clocks don't all move at the same time. So a problem you get with jet lag is that you're kind of, you're, clocks shift but they all fall out of synchrony with each other while they're shifting. Um, so if you're working rotating shifts you've got this problem of your your rhythms all trying to kind of lock on to the new time zone effectively and they all fall out of synchrony with each other but also when you eat meals that also seems to shift the timing of 
um, particularly the clocks involved in digestion. So in your liver, in your fat cells, in your muscle, in your pancreas and all that kind of thing. So there is some, I think, some really interesting work at the moment on looking at, you know, let's not worry too much about night shift workers are being exposed to light at night, but at the very least, don't eat in the middle of the night if you're working the night shift. And I mean, it's really early days and I don't think the researchers wouldn't want me to say, yeah, it works. But I think that's a really interesting idea to try and at least reduce that disruption that's going on. But it's a big issue, isn't it, for public health? It's a massive issue, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then NASA, so, so NASA's doing a lot of work in this as well for its astronauts. Yeah. And their, appro their, their attitude is what we really care about is alertness and people not falling asleep on the job. So they, they are using, you know, bright blue light in the middle of the night to, you know, just wake people up but that's going to cause more disruption and might have longer term consequences for people's health. So there's no easy answer. Indeed, but really interesting. So Joanna has asked, are we worse off for any disorders by living in Scotland than compared to the Mediterranean countries? So there's a short answer to that, which is yes. <laughs> uh, um, do you want to elaborate on that, Linda? In terms of circadian disruption, maybe? Well, circadian disruption, yes, yeah, seasonal affective disorder, definitely. Um, also, there are there are various disorders that seem to um, that seem to be uh, more prevalent at high latitudes, including multiple sclerosis. So again, you you know that um, that immune suppression effect I talked about, anyways, and and vitamin D, um, those things are are worse at higher latitudes. Yeah, and I often wonder even things like alcohol use and whether risk taking behaviour and you know self medicating mood problems whether it's it's easier to do that it's it's, it's easier to do that when you've got sunshine for example uh, whereas if you don't it's it, it, it involves lifestyle changes doesn't it as well when you live in different types of climate and sun exposures. Yeah, and actually I was just thinking, so what I didn't talk about is so there's a there's a Scottish doctor whose name I can't I've just forgotten his name. Um, Richard Weller at the University of Edinburgh, um, who he's, he's doing some, some of this work on multiple sclerosis and um, sun exposure, but his big thing is, um, is looking at heart disease and blood pressure and sun exposure. So he has found that being exposed to UV light causes a drop in blood pressure. Um, and it's, it's, it's enough to be clinically significant. So, you know, you get this, this several point drop in blood pressure, even if you're just exposed to sunlight for about half an hour and it, it carries on for about an hour or so after you step indoors. Um, so he, he wonders if that might be one reason why people living, you know, in the north of living in Scotland have higher rates of heart disease compared to people in southern England and Mediterranean countries. I mean, obviously there's lots and lots of factors and it's not just gonna be about UV light, yeah. you know, diet, all these things mm. have an impact, but sun seems to have this impact on, on heart health as well. Absolutely. So an anonymous uh, question is, would you advise buying a UV light for your house or desk, especially in Scotland in the winter? Uh, I wouldn't because of the, because of the skin cancer risk i mean so i definitely it depends what we're thinking about are we thinking about the oh, effects yeah. of sunlight on the skin or are we thinking about the circadian thing yeah. so definitely I, uv light and blue light here linda maybe that's the... yeah, yeah yeah okay so 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 uv light is is another type of light um so you have you know you have light across the whole spectrum at one end you have uv light at the other end you have infrared light and then you have the visible spectrum in the middle so when we're talking about blue light we're talking about blue the blue peak within the visible light spectrum definitely a lot of circadian biologists will have a sad light on their desk even if they don't suffer from seasonal affective disorder and they use that in the winter time to try and supplement for the lack of daylight I do this as well. I think it really, really helps. I do a fair bit of radio and that involves going into a radio studio where there's basically no light. It's really dim. Um, and, and I find having that bright blue spectrum light on in the daytime really gives me that alert, alertness boost. Um, UV light for getting vitamin D, I think, is, is more difficult because there is this increased risk of skin cancer. I wouldn't use a sunbed, for instance. I have pale skin. 
you know you can get a tan using um fake tan um but i think that i think you should take vitamin d supplements in the winter and also you know try and get vitamin d from other sources like oily fish okay great um terry john or john terry terry john would linda could you say a little bit about the amish community who don't who really okay. away from artificial light and yeah absolutely so so um as part of my book research, I went to Pennsylvania in the US to go and spend some time with an Amish community because I was really fascinated by, um, I was really fascinated to, to see what people's sleep and circadian rhythms looked like where they had this more traditional relationship with light. And the Amish are interesting because they don't have access to the electric grid because they basically don't want it's not that they're opposed to electricity per se but they um they don't want the the kind of modern trappings that electricity brings so things like television internet all that kind of thing um so i went and spent a long weekend over a bank holiday like it's memorial day weekend in may i think it's about, it's been about four years ago now um just spending you know living with this amish family and you know the really the really really big difference apart from the Amishness of it all is is that they get up so much earlier than than other Americans other Europeans do you know I just I just flown in from from London um I flown into New York and I found myself in this Amish community about two days later so I had terrible jet lag and my host said she said what do you want to do this weekend and I said I just want to basically follow you around and see how you live and ask you and your friends and family lots of questions about about light and sleep she's like fine well we want to go yard sale shopping tomorrow morning um you're very welcome to come but I warn you we're going to be getting up at 4 30 which is what we do every day is that okay <laughs> I was like, I mean, that's fine. It's about, you know, 9.30 a.m. UK time. That <laughs> sounds like a lion. Uh, but they really do, you know. They're, they're up at 4.30. They, they've eaten breakfast by 5. They're out of the house by 5.15 every day. Another big difference is that, you know, the community, they're not allowed to use cars. They kind of get around. If they have to travel any sort of long distance, it's on these kind of horse-drawn buggies. But mostly they get around by walking or scooting. They're, they're not allowed to use cycles, but they have these kind of like man-size uh, push-along scooters with bicycle wheels that you kind of pedal along with your foot pushing on the ground. Um, so, but what that means is, you know, they're out of the house at sort of 5.15, 5.30 a.m., going to their place of work, by walking or scooting, getting exposed to that bright dawn light, which is pushing their body clocks earlier. And, um, and you know, there are, pe there are Amish people who, who claim to be night owls. I interviewed one of them, she's called Katie Baylor. And I said, you know, so when would you like to get up in the morning? And she's like, oh, you know, like 6.30 or seven would be amazing. <laughs> Yeah. I'm like, yeah. when would you like to go to bed at night? And she, she was like 10 30, 11 pm. I know it's really late. <laughs> I'm like, no. Yeah. But that's that's completely normal. Um so but the other really interesting thing I think about the Amish is that they have the lowest um the lowest incidence of seasonal depression, seasonal affective disorder of any Caucasian population that's been studied so far. Mm. Um, I mean, some of that may be cultural. They're very, you know, very strongly religious and they may not want to be ungrateful for what God has provided. But, um, but you know, there's also, you know, there's this strong association. The way we treat seasonal affective disorder is by exposing people to bright light first thing in the morning. And they do that every morning without needing a light. You know, they, it's just the way they live. So, you know, I think that's really interesting. Yeah. So let's have maybe a final question and we'll type in some answers in the Q&A box for the questions that we haven't got to. I think we'll, we'll try and do that for people. Plus, obviously, Audrey's going to send a link to the whole talk. Um, so Beverly has said that in many council areas, and you'll be familiar with this, Linda, uh, councils are, are using cheaper versions of street lights that um, may have a strong blue component in them, like the LED lights. 
yes yeah. money but obviously any public health implications of that yeah and in fact the american medical association has put out a, a advisory on this um basically saying lo local authorities should be really careful about installing these <clears throat> you know the kind of classic bright white led which it doesn't look blue but it looks very you know very cold and white and bright and and certainly you know if you have one of these lights just outside your home um that there's there's you know and you, and you don't have good curtains then that light pollution may be having an impact on your sleep so the american medical association has said where possible council should be trying to um fit warmer colored leds which is possible but also direct the light, you know, install shades so the light is being directed down onto the street. And it can work. So in, you know, Moffat in southern Scotland is um, European, what's it called? It's the first dark sky town mm. in the world, I think. And I visited there and you can see, you know, they have LED lighting outdoors, but it's all, you know, it's all got these, these shades to focus it very you know just focus it down on the the pavement directly below it and if you step off a main street it's you know you're in inky blackness immediately and you know the star the stars there are amazing so that's that's worth thinking about if you if you think about all the street lights in the uk and other countries and how that could change yeah better linda i think we'll wrap it up there and say thanks very much um we'll maybe stay on and answer as many of these questions as we can i think we can save save the questions and we'll try and give a response for people and maybe audrey can disseminate that afterwards and um, but for the time being uh, i'd just like to say thanks for a brilliant talk um you and i might stay on the line uh, but yeah, stay on the line for a bit longer so thanks everyone for your participation uh, and we'll send you the link for the recorded recording of this in due course thanks Thank you for coming and attending and get outside. <laughs>